There's a part of One Piece that's widely agreed upon to have some of the best moments in the entire story. At the same time, it's also considered to be one of the worst, if not the worst arc in One Piece. But how does that make any sense? If it has some of the best moments in the story as long as One Piece, how can it also be considered as the worst part of the story? Well, today we're gonna find out exactly what went wrong with One Piece's biggest anomaly, Thriller Bark. Say what you will about Thriller Bark, but one thing I have to give it credit for is how much it sets itself apart from the other arcs. I think this is definitely the most unique arc in One Piece, except for maybe some of the ones in the Summit War Saga. It's like a spooky horror comedy that just does so much crazy shit. Like Luffy turns into a Hulk zombie. They fight this giant monster who has Luffy's personality. Robin can fly? This arc really displays Oda's creativity, and I gotta respect that. And surprisingly enough, it makes a really good first impression. The first third of this arc is, in my opinion, 10 out of 10 One Piece, mostly because of how funny it is. I think One Piece generally has some pretty good humor. It can get pretty unfunny and repetitive at times because of how often certain gags get repeated, especially when they weren't even funny the first time. But the first third of this arc has the best comedy in One Piece by far. It might have some better jokes at other parts of the story, but it's never this consistently funny for such a long period of time. There's a whole volume where I was just dying the entire time reading through, and it all starts with Brooke. Brooke is maybe the least popular character in the Straw Hats, so you'd think that the reason why this arc is so disliked might be because of him, right? Well, surprisingly, I think Brooke is one of the best aspects of this arc. When he first shows up and tells us all his skeleton and bone jokes, I actually thought they were pretty funny, which again is a bit surprising because to me, Brooke is just not funny at all. Like in every arc after this, I don't think I've ever laughed at any of his jokes. It's just the same thing over and over and over. One thing I think Oda does really well is how he's able to tell the same jokes in different ways. Like he's so determined to keep the same gags that have been in the story for years that he has to come up with new ways of telling them without it getting stale. But for some reason, he absolutely refuses to do this with Brooke. Again, it's the exact same jokes about him asking to see some girl's panties told in the exact same way every time. So this is the only time in the story it's actually funny because it's new. And it's also funny because the other characters think it's funny. Like Luffy is always there to laugh at his jokes, which helps out a lot. After this arc, no one ever laughs at him. In fact, they typically don't even have any reaction at all. It's like they just pretend he's not there. And I really like the scene where Luffy asks him to join his crew. Luffy is not someone who judges people for their appearance or background. The only thing he cares about is who they truly are. Luffy just needed to know that he was some like goofy ass skeleton that was really funny and that was good enough for him. Even though everyone else tells him it's a bad idea because he looks shady or scary. And the art in this panel is so damn good. Honestly, this arc has really good art in general. Like all the establishing shots of Thriller Bark and all the various structures that are around the island. It helps paint the spooky atmosphere even further. And speaking of spooky atmosphere, this is when we get to one of the best parts of the arc. The story makes it perfectly clear that Usopp, Nami, and Chopper do not want to go to this island and are terrified of it. Whereas the rest of the crew really want to go there. This obviously makes sense as this has been established time and time again in the story before this. So as we follow these three explore the island, it's actually kind of spooky because they're terrified of everything. Because they're terrified of everything, I'm also kind of on edge as a reader too. But as well as being on edge, I'm also just laughing my ass off because genuinely the stuff that happens is just so fucking funny. Nami looking outside the window of the carriage and seeing this lion man. Yeah! Them looking out and seeing a bunch of trees and stuff dancing. Yeah! I especially love this dude, he is just vibing out man. Then they get left in the middle of the graveyard with a bunch of zombies where Chopper punches the head off of this one zombie only for another zombie to say, you dropped this dude, thanks bro. And again, there's this really fine balance of spooky and funny that I just think works incredibly well. And of course, now it's the rest of the crew's turn to go through the island, and it is even funnier. Instead of getting scared from all the monsters here, they're the ones scaring the monsters. It's no longer spooky or scary at all, it's just 
funny. This shows us how different the members of the crew are by having them go through the exact same situation with completely different outcomes. Luffy pushes the freaking zombie back into the grave. Like, come on, bro. This shit is just too funny. And finally, they get to Dr. Hogbag's mansion, which again, like, goddamn, the art is so good. I think seeing Usopp, Nami, and Chopper slowly uncover the mystery of what's really going on is really entertaining, with Sindri being a great way for them to figure it out. The arc then does something which I think is really smart. It gives certain characters of the crew more screen time and more involvement in the story. If you watched my last video, you know that I don't really like the way a lot of the Straw Hats have gotten very little to do in the post time skip. But here, Frankie and Robin purposely get picked to be the only two members not to lose their shadow. And so while everyone else is unconscious, the two newest members of the crew are left to try to save them. It's a great way to give them more screen time in a natural way, and I especially love Frankie's involvement. He doesn't have like a big character moment in this arc or anything, but he's always involved in what's going on. He's not pushed into the back of the panel or too big to even be in it. He's center stage, always contributing. He's super reliable and his personality really bounces well off of the other characters like Lou Luffy and Zoro. Like I said in the last video, he really feels like the crew's big brother. Another character that I'm really glad got the chance to shine in this arc is Chopper. He's someone who I think really doesn't get a lot to do in the story compared to the other Straw Hats, and he's the perfect character to have face off against Dr. Hogback because of course, they're both doctors. And there's an interesting moral conflict between them in regards to what it means to be a doctor. Their motivations and methods are completely different and it leads to some really satisfying clashes between them. Now, I have been pretty positive towards this arc so far, but this is when one of the biggest issues with the arc happens, and it has a lot to do with Brook. Even though I said he's one of the best aspects of this arc, there is something that really holds him back. You see, Soro fights this skeleton dude who has Brook's shadow, and it's it's a really cool fight, but it's a bit disappointing that Brook isn't the one to win the fight. In fact, it's kind of disappointing that Brook doesn't really do that much in this arc at all. When you think about every arc before this, when a new straw hat would join, the conflict of those arcs would always be tied to that new straw hat. They had to defeat Arlong and save Nami's village before she joined. They had to defeat Kuro before Usopp joined to stop him from taking over Kaya's property. But Brook has no real relation to the villains of this arc nor does he ever play a big role in defeating them. He has some great personal struggles that he overcomes later in the story, but I think it's a bit disappointing that those aren't tied to the antagonists at all. Especially considering he's been trapped on this island for 50 years. It makes him feel as not as important as the rest of the crew. It would be one thing if the story had plans for him after this, like it had with Nami and Robin or even Sanji, but as we all know, it did not have any plans for him. Soro also also just didn't need this fight because he had such an amazing moment at the end of the arc. In fact, I think that moment could have been even better if Soro didn't fight Ryuma. Imagine if Soro didn't have to do that much work during this arc. It would have kind of led us into this false sense of security. Like, damn, Soro didn't even have to go all out for us to win this time, only for Kuma to show up at the end. But again, I do think this fight with Soro is at least pretty good, so there's that. And following this, we once again have some peak One Piece with Usopp versus Perona. I already talked about why the moment where he uses the 10 ton hammer is so good in my last video. It's mainly because the audience were aware of the fact that he has the hammer, and also because the other characters in the show that see it for the first time won't necessarily know it's fake. But I also love this fight because it shows that Usopp is able to overcome his fear if his friend's safety is on the line. Him being the one to scare Perona instead of the other way around is such a good twist. It's also got a ton of funny moments. This is easily Usopp's best fight in the entire story. And following this, we have a bit of controversy because of Sanji. This fight is often looked at as pretty bad because Sanji ends up looking like a creep. It turns out the reason Sanji was so angry at this invisible dude, or at least a big reason as to why, is because he really wanted to eat the devil fruit that makes you invisible because he wanted to use it to peep at women. Is this nigga serious? Now, I think there's two ways of looking at this. On one hand, I think it's clear that this is entirely supposed to be a joke. You know how sometimes Luffy will say something so unbelievably stupid that you're just kind of shocked at how dumb it is? Like, Luffy is dumb, but he's not that dumb, and it's clear that Oda will sometimes exaggerate how 
stupid he is for the sake of a joke, even though he isn't actually that dumb. And I think that's what happens here with Sanji. Like, it's clear that Sanji is upset that Absalom did what he did to Nami, but for the sake of a joke, Oda exaggerates Sanji's perverted nature. The other characters in this room even acknowledges this, saying how his anger is misplaced, almost like it's breaking the fourth wall to tell us that this was just a joke. I think this is a perfectly fine way of looking at it, especially because I actually think the jokes are pretty funny. But the other way of looking at it is that this joke didn't need to happen at all, and it could have been a cool character moment for Sanji that was ruined for the sake of a joke. I think this is also a fair way of looking at it. Honestly, I don't really mind this gag at all and thought it was really funny. We could have had a nice character moment for Sanji, I suppose, but I don't really know if it was needed, and considering this has been an arc that has been a lot more comedic than the others, I think this approach worked well. Now, once again, the portion of the story I've talked about so far has been peak One Piece, aside from a small issue. Knowing what happens at the end of this arc, you'd think that this would be one of the best arcs in One Piece. And so far, it's en route to be that. But unfortunately, this is where the arc takes a big turn for the worse. And the main reason for that is the antagonists. I think the villains so far have been pretty good. But when it comes to the main villains of the arc itself, they really suck. I think it's cool to see the Straw Hats all fight together against a strong opponent without Luffy, but Ors is just the most boring opponent. He has Luffy's personality, but aside from that, there is nothing to him aside from him being a big strong monster. So much so that I don't even have any more to say about him, he's just boring. And then we have Moria, who we really don't know anything about, aside from the fact that he's evil for some reason. Whatever subtleties his character might have are never really a factor in the story. His motivations and personality are either bland or non-existent, and it doesn't help that his devil fruit powers is just the most bullshit thing ever. He just pulls different moves and attacks out of his ass, and it feels really cheap because we have no way of knowing what will defeat him. Whenever the Straw Hats try to outsmart him, he just does some bullshit that completely nullifies their efforts. Like when Robin catches him and breaks his neck, only for Moria to switch places places with his shadow? Like, when could he do that? I still think the Straw Hats are incredibly fun to watch here, but their dancing partners just suck. And to combat Moria, we have Zombie Luffy. Yes, this is real. I actually really like Luffy turning into Zombie Hulk, I'm not gonna lie. It's pretty funny and kinda awesome. The panel where he stops Ors' hand is just so cool. It's a pretty good idea, but I think the way the fight ends is super unsatisfying. Earlier in the arc, it was established that the only way for shadows to return to their bodies was if Moria decided it. Even if he dies, the shadow will remain where they are if Moria does not say otherwise. So it got me thinking, how are they gonna do this? How are they gonna make Moria give the shadows back? Are they gonna threaten his comrades like Dr. Hobback so he can't make any more zombies? I figured they would find some sort of clever solution. But instead, at the last minute, Moria busts out another new ability that lets him absorb a thousand shadows, including the crew's shadows. And because this ability works completely differently, the only thing Luffy needs to do is punch him really hard and the shadows will return. I have no idea why the objective of how to win was changed at the very last second of the story. Moria is genuinely terrible, and his ability just sucks. And once again, Brook's role in this fight is just non-existent. Like I said earlier, there are some things about Moria that are like sort of interesting, like the way he got crushed in the new world and got depressed because his crew died. That's why he created an immortal zombie army that could never die. But I really don't think those aspects come through in his character in an interesting way. I mean, he's not even depressed at all. He's always laughing and scheming. Honestly, it looks like he's living his best life, just trapping people in his evil horror island. So yeah, the conclusion to this main struggle is really whack, even though all the Straw Hats and Luffy are consistently entertaining. But luckily, we get some more peak One Piece right after this. Dropping Kuma into the story like this is such a smart move, I think. It's kind of like when Mihawk showed up at the Baratie to show how dangerous the Grand Line will be. Kuma's abilities feel so mysterious and alien that it does a great job at foreshadowing what's to come moving forward. And obviously, he gives Sora what I would say is his best moment in the entire story. Sora is such a consistently written character in my opinion. He always says and does things according to his own beliefs and morality, no matter the situation. Sora takes all the pain 
Kane meant for Luffy because that is his job as the first mate and the second strongest. Regardless of what other dreams and ambitions he has, nothing matters more than his task of making Luffy the Pirate King. And we see Zoro do similar things to this throughout the entire story, like when he's ready to cut his legs off in Little Garden, or when he asks to be trained by his rival because he knows he needs to get stronger for Luffy's sake. Everything he does is for Luffy and his dream. There is no reason to tell people what happened with Kuma because Zoro simply did his job, which is nothing to brag about. And I also love the way Sanji tries to sacrifice himself instead. Sanji is also such a consistent character, always putting the life of his crewmates above his own, even when it's the person on the crew he always fights with. Him acting this way now of course makes a lot more sense after the whole cake arc, so this is great foreshadowing and character writing. And I love the way Zoro ends up being the one to take the pain over Sanji. Sanji wanting to take the pain comes from an irrational place, stemming from low self-worth, even though he is equally valuable than the rest of the crew. And Sora wanting to take the pain comes from a sense of duty and loyalty. They are both trying to do the same thing, but with completely different motivations, and ultimately Sora is the one that ends up doing it, because his motivations come from a rational and just place. So much incredible stuff happens in this moment where apparently nothing happened, and luckily we still have one more peak moment to end this arc on. While I am a bit mixed on Brook's inclusion in this arc, his backstory is incredible. It's so goddamn sad and depressing and really recontextualizes his character. I think it can be easy to think that Brook is kind of a wasted and unnecessary character after this point in the story, mainly because he never does anything, but this backstory really changes how you look at him. And because it happened so long ago, most people forget the details of it. Brook finally gets over his survivor's guilt and Luffy accepts him with open arms. Knowing Laboon is waiting for him still, he knows he needs to stay alive. It's easily a top tier One Piece backstory. I wish Brook got this type of focus later in the story as well. All in all, I think this is a really good arc, but unfortunately it has some really bad aspects. And I mean really bad. Which is a shame because I genuinely believe this could have been one of One Piece's best arcs. I mean, all the pieces are there. It has the best comedy in all of One Piece. It has character moments for basically every single character. It has a completely different feel than the rest of the arcs and perfectly executes the genre blend it goes for. It has Soro's best moment in the story and one of the best backstories in the story. But unfortunately, it has two issues that really hold it back. One Piece does not always have the best villains. When it does, it's amazing. But when it doesn't, it really sucks. And it just so happens that not only does this arc have a bad villain, it has probably the worst villain in the whole story. It makes the third act kind of boring to go through. Like when I finished the first and second third of the arc and got to the main fight with Moria, I was just kind of like, man, can we go back to that? And the second issue is Brook's inclusion. Now, this isn't nearly as big of an issue as Moria and Ors, especially because Brook was really entertaining when he did have stuff to do in this arc, but I can't help but feel like these issues are very linked. Like I said before, in every One Piece arc before this, when a member of the crew would join, they would have some sort of relation to the antagonists. Had Brook had that with Moria, I would have felt more urgency to beat Moria, and it would have felt more personal. And it also would have felt like Brook really Really overcame an obstacle instead of just having Soro do it for him. But I have no idea what Brook even thinks of Moria. I mean, he basically gets his shadow back before Moria even shows up. This arc was so close to being amazing, but unfortunately, it has issues that are just too big to overlook. But regardless, I still think it absolutely slaps and doesn't get enough credit. In fact, I think it has a lot of aspects that a lot of the arcs in the post time skip completely fail at. But you have to check out this video to find out which aspects those are.